Peace and blessings on all these brothers and sisters tonight. Uh, we have some non-Muslim guests here. Uh, Mashallah, that's, that's always always thankful for my non-Muslim non brothers and sisters to show up too. Uh, <coughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard McKinney. Uh, I have several names. Uh, FBI also knows me as Omar Saeed. Omar Saeed. Uh, I have a. I, I am married and have a teenage daughter, so I'm pretty much used to being called anything. Uh, I. Uh, I've been asked to speak to the community, both Muslim and non-Muslim about my journey uh, to finding truth or even beyond truth to finding understanding. Um, when I started lecturing I, I had titled my, my, my lecture from hatred to understanding because that's really what it was. I, uh, I had had a troubled youth, um, ran away from home, it's involved in all kinds of bad things. Never graduated high school. But I joined the military. The military gave me a lot of things. It gave me gave me a home. It gave me a family. But it also gave me these things seated in my mind that that to this day I still I still try to erase. But other than that. I had went through life, been to all different kinds of countries, been to every continent except Antarctica. I used to tell people until they put penguins on a terrorist watch list, I probably wouldn't go there. <laughs> but having seen these other cultures, these other people, being to many of the places that you all are from yourselves, I found an enemy, something that I could call the hated one, something that for whatever it took or for whatever it meant that I could fight against. I wouldn't run out of enemies. So my enemy became Islam. I used to say that Islam was a cancer in society and I was, I was going to do everything I could to be the surgeon to remove it. But one day, my daughter came home from school and she was talking about this lady who came in to give or to pick up her son. And of course, you know, our children, they don't know races differences and prejudices and all this and all the, all the nasty stuff adults deal with, you know. Children don't know this. They learn this from us and from the rest of society. Now this hatred that I had for Islam was mine. I was very selfish about that hatred. Very stingy. I wasn't going to share it with anybody. So let me backtrack. I was forced out of the military because I got injured in Iraq. So they were medically retiring me. I was mad. I didn't want to get out. I begged and begged to go back to Iraq. And they, would, they asked me, they go, why? I said, I'm not done killing Muslims. deep-seated hatred. I often equated my hatred to that of another organ in my body. Is there anybody here that wants to get rid of their liver? Their heart? No, you'll die, right? That's the way I felt about this hatred. It was what was keeping me alive. I devised a plan. I was going to do my part. The most I could do I had learned to make IEDs. I had learned how they were put together. 
It's not real hard. And I was going to make one. And I was going to set it outside the Islamic Center in Muncie, Indiana, and set it off on Friday, Juma. 150 to 200 people. That was my target. Now, I know I would have ended up in a federal prison. And I know I would have had a needle stuck in my arm. But at that moment, that frame of mind that I had, I would have laid there on the gurney with a smile on my face because I would have done one last thing for my country. One last thing. Whether anybody recognized it for that or not, I would have done it. Now, I say all of this right now because I'm, I, I, I'm in front of an audience and, and, and it's a big audience and I'm trying to uh, be very serious about what, what I'm saying so I'm trying to get that point across. Usually I'm very jovial and I'll get to that. But, but that's how serious I was. Now, coming back, my daughter is telling me about this lady coming in to get her son covered from head to toe. I knew exactly what it was right off as soon as she said that. And, you know, she was just asking because she didn't understand it. She's, she's seven years old. She don't understand that. She's never seen that before. I went off. I started spewing all kinds of hateful things out of my mouth, cussing and everything. And my daughter, who, uh, who was my buddy, she's a teenager now, so she don't have any time for dad, but she was my buddy. You know? And she looked at me, questioning the love she had for me. And that's when a light bulb came on. You are forcing this prejudice on someone else. Even though I would have been happy with eradicating the world of Islam off the face of the earth, I did not want to force anybody else to feel the same way as I did. To this day, I still don't understand that. That makes no sense. That's the way I felt. Nobody knew about the plan that I had. Nobody. My wife did not know about the plan that I had until the FBI showed up with a bomb dog. She's still with me. I don't know. But nobody knew. And that's the way I wanted it, that's the way I wanted it done. So I decided one day, because of what was going on here, and because of the look I got from my daughter, that I was going to take the opportunity to go to the mosque, meet these people. And in my whole arrogance and narcissism, I actually said to myself, I'm going to give them one last chance, like I'm somebody. <laughs> and I walked in. It was really interesting because it was Juma, but I got there early. That's because that's the way I work, I guess. I get every place early. And there was only one other person there. Really tall African American African American gentleman. Found out he actually played pro basketball in the seventies. Um he uh he was bent over taking off his shoe and he looked over at me and he smiled and I looked at him and I looked at who you know, like, who are you? <laughs> And he knew I was out of place, and he said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I want you to teach me about Islam. He said, well, okay. How long do you have? I said, I got a couple hours. He said, we'll give it a shot. So they took me into the prayer room and uh, set me back on the, some benches at the back of the room and handed me some pamphlets, which... Uh, as at the last mosque that I was at, I guess these are like the, the international Islamic pamphlets because everybody has the same ones, I guess. But, uh, I was looking at them, I'm like, this is just more propaganda. So I just took it with a grain of salt, listened to the chutbah. It's good. It sounded good. Oh, man, I was so just, oh, ah, that's pretty neat. That's better than church, right? But they did, the only reason they said that stuff is because I'm here. I even, and, and I, 
I laughed this off almost as, as immediately as I, I thought about it, but I'm like, I got really anxious. I got this real nervous feeling in my stomach. As I'm sitting back there, and the room had started to fill up, I'm thinking, I am the only non-Muslim in here, and that door is way over there. Oh man, I'm going to end up on Al Jazeera with a sword in my throat. I actually thought that, and, and, and as I thought it, I was like, oh, no, nah, that, that's just silly, man. It, you know, they, they don't like you, yeah, they want to kill you, but they're not going to, it's okay. it's okay. That's what I'm telling myself, right? And so after it was all over, I got introduced to a few more people and a few more people. And I was taken into the library, and we sat down on the couch, and I was asked, have you ever read the Quran? <laughs> I was like, no. Now, now, take a second here. None of these people know what I have in store for them. I went in there with just under the impression that I'm just curious about Islam. I just want to learn a little bit more about it, man. You know? Uh, so, you know, they went over to the bookshelf, grabbed the Quran, handed it to me. Said, I. If you can, I want you to stay here a little longer. I'm going to talk, you know, we, we can still talk, but I, when you leave here today, I want you to take this home. I want you to read it. And when you have questions, because you will, come back and ask. We'll let you know what, what it means. We'll let you know what they're talking about. And about that time, this older gentleman, who is, is a very dear friend of mine now, uh, a doctor, as I'm sitting on the couch, comes up, sits at my feet. Now, here I am, an American. Now, I know there's a cultural thing, and that's not really a big deal in other cultures, but, you know, it's kind of a shine of respect and admiration and whatever, da da da. But you don't do that in American society. You don't sit at somebody's feet. You know, that's like seriously belittling yourself. This guy comes up, sits at my feet, hugs my leg, and cries. And he starts talking about the love of Islam. So there's a little tick up in my head. It's like, hmm. Either this guy doesn't know anything about Islam, or there's something more to this. So I'm starting to think. The wheels are turning. And I decided, and I don't know how I do this sometimes. Sometimes I amaze myself because I, was, I, I actually made a promise to myself that I was going to put the same energy and keeping my mind open, my mouth shut, and turning off the TV while I try to figure this Islam thing out that I put into hating Islam. So I went home and I read the Quran. I read it twice in eight weeks. All my free time was spent either reading the Quran on YouTube, looking up articles, and of course, we all know the internet, we're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's okay. It's okay. Sometimes you need to see the good, the bad, the ugly. All of it. Because you need to know what you're going up against sometimes. Within eight weeks, I went back on a Juma, and I said, I, I want to take my Shahada. And it's funny because a lot of Christians that I know of and that I know personally actually believe the whole convert or die thing. That if, you, if you're overseas and they, and they get a hold of you and you don't convert to Islam, they'll kill you. But when I went back and said, I want to take Shahada. I want to be a Muslim. That very same guy that was crying at my feet that one day... I was like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure this is really what you want to do? It hasn't been that long. No, I got this. I know. When you know, you know. And I took my shahada that day. And then I went through the course of dismantling all the stuff that I had and disposing of it uh, properly. I have to say that now. Lawyer says I have to say that. Uh, and kind of going on about my life, learning, 
I was actually it was I I, I was brought into into play with uh, uh, they allowed me to start delivering hutbas, which was very humbling to me because you know we don't have an imam, so we just have a rotation of of people who have who are respected for their knowledge of Islam that give Friday sermons, and. I used to tell people I was the dumbest person on the list because I was the only one who didn't have doctor before his name. But, and then shortly after that, they came to me and they go, Brother Rick, we want you to run for president. I was like, excuse me? Of, here, of this place right here? They said, yeah. We want you to be the face of this community because we think that you are what we need to take us into the future, to get us through this presidency and this election and everything else. I was like, I understood they had an agenda. You know, hey, it's marketing, right? I have this white guy on there. He's the face of Islam for Muncie. Okay, I can do that. So I took it and I ran with it. And some things that I didn't like that were cultural and uh, not, I felt, I, I questioned the whole fact that the validity of them being Islamic and not cultural. Uh, we changed. Um, because I think I'm truly blessed in the fact that what I learned about Islam come from the Quran, come from the Hadith, come from very learned people. Not because somebody told me this is how we do this. Our faith has been led, I won't say astray, but has been led in different directions because of a lot of culturalism. Because we've let governments guide us on how we practice Islam. Now, In saying that, America is the best place for Islam, for many reasons. But it's the best place for Islam simply because you can practice Islam how it was meant to be practiced, and not because somebody teaches you to do it this way. You can practice Islam according to what the Sunnah, the Hadith, very, very wise scholars, and most importantly, the Quran, say. I corrected them on a lot of things while I was there, and it, 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 I had to humble myself several times because I'm telling these people, you know, something they should already know on the way they, they, they deal with their, with their women. Um, several things about, about how well, when I, I was asked to run for re-election when it came time, but I was finishing school and I just didn't have time to, 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 put on the, uh, to put into it. And I didn't want to do that to the community, so I stepped aside. But I nominated a female to be president of the mosque. And afterwards, some of, the, some of the brothers came to me and they said, Brother Rick, that's kind of progressive, isn't it? I said, really? I said, why am I always telling you, you guys, explaining your history to you guys? I said, who was the first Muslim? Who created the first known university and library? These are women. And the woman that I nominated was more qualified than any man in that community, including myself, to hold that position. So it wasn't something that was done just because she was a female. It was done because she deserved that position. She had full capabilities of that position. And that was why it was done. That's Islamic. Now, what I, what I really want to get across to a lot of people is this this thing, this hatred that we have, and we all have had it, it doesn't matter, nobody's, nobody's immune, 
because you're a Muslim does not mean you have not hated in your life or you don't hate now. There's no reason for it. It's a cancer. That is the cancer. The hatred. We have what I call the big three. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the Abrahamic religions. Okay? There are similarities that are too numerous to count and a few discrepancies. There is no reason that we cannot get along with a fellow human being because they pray differently than us or they read a different text than us. And that goes vice versa. I tell them the same thing. There's no reason. They're like, well, you believe in a different God. I was like, explain that. Well, you believe in, in a, a law. Is it, is it a law? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's a law. I said, do you know what a law means? And no. Well, let me explain it to you. And so we go into a language thing. And when I explain it in that manner, they're like, oh, Arab Christians really say a law? They do. Oh, okay. So it's the same. It is the same. Now, I don't want anyone here to think that I'm, I'm selling a different kind of faith or, you know, propositioning anything t towards that extent. But we need to set the example. I believe Islam is the truth. I believe Islam is the way. And I only pray to Allah that I feel that way for the rest of my days. But we have to be the ones to lead the, lead the, uh, to lead the charge. We have to be the ones to set the example. That's on us. That was the creed to us by Allah. <laughs> We're leaders. We're not followers. When we have people, extremists, fundamentalists, as I call knuckleheads, painting a picture of my faith in the light that I once believed it to be, that's wrong. And people are like, well, why is it? Americans hate every individual Muslim. Why is it that they don't just look at us as just a person and another person and another person? I said, do you really want the answer? You're not going to like it. And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, that's your fault. He said, what? That's your fault. Depending on who you ask, there's just shy of or just over two billion Muslims in the world. So let's just even it out and say there's two billion Muslims in the world. Less than 1% of them are extremists, fundamentalists, zealots, knuckleheads. That 1% is speaking for the 99%. Why is that? So whenever you get upset at why people are talking bad about Islam, you need to go look in the mirror. Because in that, in that mirror, you're going to see both the cause and the solution to that problem. If you can conceive it, you can con achieve it. I have full faith in you that everybody in this room can change the world. They told me I couldn't. I told my professors, I told friends, I told family, I said, watch, I'm going to change the world. I said, eh, okay, okay, just settle down there. But I, I, that's what I believed. And when that video came out and I read through the comments, I stumbled upon this one. And I won't say exactly what he said because 
It doesn't need to be mentioned. Language like that does not need to be used in a, in a house of God. But when he 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 said, if if a bad dude, marine killing machine like you, can change his ways and can change his thinking, I guess I can too. I changed the world. There's not anyone in here that can't tell me they can't do the same thing. Not anyone. So please, do not let that 1% speak for you. You know? Let them do what they got to do. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Because in the end, they'll get theirs. Allah knows best. And Allah, Allah will judge him on that merit. I have full faith that if you wake up in the morning and before you go to sleep that night, you tell yourself, I'm going to make somebody smile today. That's not like putting a dump truck on that scale of deeds. Weighing the good with the bad. Because that should be a goal of every human being. But to a Muslim, it goes beyond that. To a Muslim, it's a duty. It's not a, well, I hope I can. Well, I'll try. No. It's a duty. You have to do that. You have to. We're the leaders. We're the ones who teach. And we teach without any kind of malice. We teach without any kind of hopes and, 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 and dreams that we're going to bring these people to our way. Because that's not our goal. Our goal is to educate. Our goal is to, is to cause understanding. What they do with that information that we give them, it's between them and Allah. Let him deal with that. That's on him. He knows best. You just talk to him. And show him good character. I've learned this. I have a lot in my life to be ashamed of. A lot. The way I've treated people in the past. The way I've lived my life. I was a very disrespectful person. But I used almost a thug mentality in saying, well, if you don't like it, do something about it. I'm a little bit older now. So when people talk about it, I, I, I heard somebody say, yeah, man, you're a pretty bad dude. I says, only on paper. <laughs> not physically, not anymore. But that's the way I lived my life. And that's the way I try to project myself on everybody else. Was, if you don't like it, do something about it. But then I learned. And now, I just try to show people. My wife, when it was funny because, of course, she freaked out a little bit after she found out that I went to the masjid for the first time. She thought I was doing some kind of reconnaissance or something, right? I mean, again, she didn't know what I really had in plan, what I had planned, but she thought I was doing some kind of, oh, let's check this out a little bit. So she was kind of anxious, a little scared. I said, nah, I just went there to talk to him. Just, you know, see what was up, you know. And uh, eight weeks later, I come back and say, hey, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> She got very irate. Now she had always, she had never been anti-Islam, anti, really anti-anything. She believed there was good and bad in everybody. And that's just the way she lived her life. She would get kind of upset with me when she, when she would hear me banner about, about Muslims and this, that, and the other because she just didn't think that was a fair assumption for me to make. But she 
she allowed it because she knew that I had more experience with Muslims than she did. So, you know, well, okay, if that's the way he feels, that's the way he feels. But when I came home and told her that, that, that I was a Muslim, she just flipped out. She said, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I am not covering my head. <laughs> I was like, you're not a Muslim. I wouldn't even think you would want to. I don't know. Whatever, you know. You, you, you spend a fortune on hair anyway, I'd really hate for you to cover it up, you know? Jeez. And then she goes, well, if you want more than one wife, you need to get rid of me first because I'm not putting up with that. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, half the time I don't want the one, so, uh, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Must have loved it. But, but uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't get the, the whole more than one YA now. Mm -mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm too tired to do that. I can't. Yeah, I have enough problems with the one and the, and the, and the daughter. I'm, yeah, there's no way. So, but, you know, of course, it, all that's kind of comical. But, you, you know, as, as, as she went on and on and, you, you know, she was trying to get, trying to figure out, what I'm doing from day to day because I'm still trying to figure out this new life that I have, you know, and, and you know, it was taken slowly. I used to get so upset because I couldn't pray because I couldn't, I, you know, I couldn't memorize al fataha you know, and, and, and I, you know, just worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and I just get so upset. But so every day was learning, you know, even today, every day is learning, you know, I learn something new every day. Um, you know, and, and, and some people will say that, you know, man, you know a lot about Islam. I, dude, what I know would go through the needle or the, the head of a sewing needle. I, 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 you know, but I guess to you, yes, I know a lot about Islam. So, but, um, so four years later, we had an Islamic Awareness Week at the university there where I live, and we had a guest lecturer. Do not remember his name because I have a bad memory. I forgot what I just said, so it doesn't matter. That's how bad it is. But uh, the the lecture he gave was three religions, one God. That was the title of it. Three three religions, one God. And within that lecture, she got the answer to the question, and I don't even know what that question was now, but she got the answer to the question that she had been trying to get an answer from me with. I didn't know. And uh, my daughter and her both took Shahada right after that lecture. This surprised me. I said, wow. So we get in the car and I said, so I guess I can get that second wife now, huh? <laughs> Oh no no, she still wasn't going for that one. Uh, but yeah, so so um, so it was it was it, it was it was exciting. It was exciting. But it was because I had shown her, you know, wow, this guy, you know, he, he doesn't drink, you know, he doesn't try to look at the girls on TV anymore, you know. What's up with that, you know? I like this guy here, you know, this, this guy's all right. And, and, and she, uh, so she saw that and she, it inspired her, it inspired her. And that's what I'm saying. We are put on this earth to inspire others, to live well amongst each other, to coexist amongst each other, you know? Not everybody is going to be a Muslim. It's a sad fact. They're not. And that's okay. Because that's not for us. But if we can treat them good and then say, Oh, well, you know what? I don't know what's going on over here. Because I know some Muslims and they don't act like that. That's what you want. That's what you're going for. That's what you're shooting for. Not for you to walk into a store wearing a kufi or wearing a hijab and people going I wonder if they got a gun I wonder if they got a bomb strapped underneath that uh, uh, underneath the the sister got a bomb strapped underneath her dress you know what I mean because people think that I know that because that's what I thought 
when we're out there, one of the first things that we need to do is to recognize the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and and smile, smile. A neighbor gives you a dirty look, spits at your feet, calls your name, smile. One, because that really irritates somebody that's mad at you. And that's always fun. That's always fun. But the other thing is, you know what? They can't get to you. They can't get to you because you have a law, and a law makes you stronger. Haters are always going to hate. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. And I talk about that when you go out into public and about how you look and how you carry yourself because it happened to me. You know, I'm a white guy. I go into a store, nobody really gives me a second look. Okay? It's just the way it is. It's that white privilege, right? Call it what it is. I walked into a Walmart, I gave a hood ball one, one, one Friday, and I had to get something at the store before I went home. I wasn't even thinking. But when I, you know, when I delivered the hoop, I, I, I tried to, I, I dress more traditional. You know, I don't wear a suit or anything. I wear a throbe and a kufi and, you know, that's what I wear. Well, I went to Walmart with that kufi and that throbe still on. And I didn't even think about it. Didn't even think about it. And I'm standing in line at the checkout and I started to feel real uneasy. And I started looking around, and everybody was like, you know, oh my God. And I was like, oh man. And then it hit me. I was like, oh, that's what that feels like. Mm hmm. Don't like it. Don't like it. But what I told myself out of that, is that experience is that, yes, I understand white privilege. And yes, I do have white privilege. And you know what? I'm glad because I'm going to take advantage of that white privilege. Because I'm going to use that. I'm going to use it to get to people that other people are not able to. Because with that white privilege, that's going to allow me in certain doors and w without any hindrance. And then all I got to do is grab their attention. That's all I got to do. I just got to get their attention and I got them. So I'm glad. I'm glad of that. Um, but, uh, you know, again, Allah always has a path for us, always has a plan for us. He's the best of planners. Um, another thing that I, 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 I like to talk about is, is, is a lot of us, as Muslims, but really even more as human beings, we're self doubters. We have, a, we have a lack of understanding on how much we can actually achieve, you know? You have to think. We have a creator. All-knowing, all-seeing, best planner, most merciful. And we were created with some of those same attributes, but we don't use them. You know, like most of the brothers I talk to, um, they're good at math, computers and all kinds of stuff. Me? Uh-uh. What was easy for me to determine my major in college was one that did not involve math. I don't do math. My daughter asked me a math question one time. And she knows I didn't know the answer to it. She's just being, just being, duh, right? So she asked me this math question. I just looked at her and says, Allah knows best, and walked away. <laughs> and just walked away. Because I didn't, I don't know. <laughs> the college requirement where I went to in order just to graduate and get a degree, I had to take it twice because I failed it the first time. Second time I got a 75, I'm like, whoop, I'm out. You know, uh, so yeah, math's not my thing. So, uh, 
But we were all made with these qualities. And, and, and people don't understand this whole self-doubting, this whole, oh, woe is me, you know. And I, I say these things because I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly how you feel. I was there. I was there as a veteran, you know, who had made decisions. And people on both sides didn't go home because of the decisions I made. That's a burden to carry on you that a lot of human beings don't understand. But even stuff like that, you cannot let get in your way. You cannot. I had to learn in my transformation that I had to be all the way over here with my hatred, as extreme as it was, before I could come back to here. I had to be on the edge before I could come back to center. Because that's the way I'm made up. But I had to have the courage to do it. Self-doubting, you can't do that. Everybody in here can change the world. Everybody. But you have to want to do it. And you don't have to... I mean, changing the world is not like, you know, changing leadership or, or, or renaming countries or anything. That's not changing the world. That's creating havoc. That's all that's doing. I should know because we did it. And still do it today. If you can make someone down on their luck, that is, is, is willing to just jump off a bridge. They're so down. They're so depressed. They're, they're just hating the fact that they still are breathing. If you can put your arm around them and say, brother, say, sister, I got you. I got you. You change the world. You've done it. If you know a couple who's having marital problems and you talk to them and you say, brother, sister, I got you. You change the world. You change the world. This is something that each and every one of us can do. And I say I know we can do it because a lot tells you you can do it. He just, uses some, he just uses different semantics, but he tells you you can do it. He wants you to do it. He took me, someone who would not have been happy until the last Muslim in the world was dead, to standing in front of you, to, or well, sitting in front of you tonight, telling you that you can change. Not that you guys, anybody here wants anybody else dead, but it doesn't matter. We all know, regardless, and for the most part, it's between us and Allah. I speak for myself also. Always something about us we can change. Always something about us we can make better. Whether it's getting stronger, getting healthier, losing weight, to reading more, to... Uh, Promising to never watch Fox News again. <laughs> Whatever. There's always something that we can do. And I know there is, and I know there's a way to accomplish that because Allah says so. I can prove it. It's in the book. He said so. He wants you to do that. He wants you to be that leader, not that follower. Again, I really feel that's why Islam, especially now, is making such an impact in, in, in America. Because regardless of what happened after the first person stuck their foot at Plymouth Rock, they came here for religious freedom. A whole, other stuff, a whole lot of other stuff happened after that. But the reason they came here was for religious freedom. They wanted to worship God in their way. 
not the way the government told them to. So they came here. Now, a few hundred years later, here we are. There are very few of it. Well, I don't know. I should probably, I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, most of you are either first generation, or are, or were born in another country. But you're here. Different reasons. Everybody has a different reason. Most of the people I know were refugees, and they ended up coming here because it's safer. You know, they want to raise their family. They want to keep their family safe. They're here. But, regardless of what is going on in our politics, this nation is still about freedoms. Not telling you to worship and pray in a certain way because the government says so, but the way you want to and the way you think you should. So you have that freedom now to open the Quran. To read it and really understand it without something back here going. Tch, tch, tch. Because that's what's happened to a lot, a lot of our religion. A lot of our religion has been sent off in different directions because governments want to control things. And it happens here. Governments want to control things. And that's why they try to, that's why the, the Muslim ban happened. You know, it wasn't an Arab ban. Wasn't a, uh, you, you know, Indochina ban, Afghani ban, it was a Muslim ban. Why'd that happen? Again, 1% is speaking for the rest of us. That's why it happened. Please ask me some questions. Please. Pretty please. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, the brother asked about uh, it, uh, what was it that impacted my decision within that eight weeks? What did I read or what did I hear or, or whatnot? And um, well, as far as the reading goes, uh, really, I think the most impactful things that I read in the Quran that, that really changed me at that point were the verses of to save a human, to, to save one human being is to save all of humanity, and to kill one human being is to kill all of humanity. Now, I really take a, I, I took a lot of stock into that, and took my time and, and, and looked into that, and really just molded over in my mind. Um, humbly, I have to admit that you know people have said that I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a little smart. So I do think about things quite a bit, and I think, try to think about them kind of deeply. And when I read those and equated Al-Qaeda, ISIS, well, no, sorry, we didn't have ISIS yet. <laughs> the United States hadn't made ISIS yet, so we, we, we didn't have that. But the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, okay? We, uh, so I thought about that and I was like, man, wow. Now I get to the point to where, yes, the 1%, the 99%, 1% doesn't know what they're talking about. I learned that most of them could care less about the organization's philosophy, theology, or anything. Most of them that join these organizations are just looking for revenge. 
because something we did. Um, somebody asked me one time, what's the quickest way to make a, make a terrorist? Drone attack his village. An example would be, here I live down on the end of the street here. I don't do nothing. I work all day, support my family, pray five times, go to Juma. That's my life. Some bad guy comes in to visit a friend that lives on the other end of the street. U.S. finds out about it, sends a drone over. They take him out. They also took out the rest of the block. I'm still alive. My family's gone. I want payback. And there's not very many of us in here that could say we wouldn't feel the same way. They took my family. It means nothing to him to drive a truck full of explosives into a gate somewhere. It means nothing to him to put on a bomb vest and blow himself up in a crowd. Nothing. Because he's lost everything. You took it away. So those were two things. But the other thing was getting back to the character. The character of the people within that community. Because, especially until I became a Muslim, because once I became a Muslim, there was all kinds of things that were going on because um, um, people were still a little nervous. Again, they did not... I, I told people about what I had planned six months after I became a Muslim because I wanted to feel comfortable around the rest of the community before I told them, hey, I was going to kill all you guys, by the way. <laughs> uh, but the way they treated me, I, I, I wasn't a Muslim. I just showed interest in their beliefs. I was invited over to houses, fed, you know. Uh, the, the president now uh, of the Islamic Center, uh, her, her family is were very good friends, uh, all, all of them, their kids, everything. And uh, she, she invited me over to her house, well, her and her husband invited me over to her house several times just to have dinner. I'm like thinking, man, these people don't even know me. They just come over to the house. You know, being an American, okay, American society, we don't do that to people. You know, I don't know whether it's just a lack of trust or, you know, I mean, in my former life, I actually used to have a t shirt that says, I used to be a people person. But people ruined it. <laughs> because that's the way a lot of American society lives their life. You know, like, I'm doing what I'm doing, everybody else is, get on my way. Leave me alone. But Muslims don't act like that. Not supposed to. Right? Do they? It happens. Sure. But when I saw that character and saw how, you know, here's this guy and the, 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 the husband is the one who was crying at my feet. Uh, you know, I see this guy. This guy's got everything, man. You know, I mean, you know, so I, you know, in my American societal thought, he's got everything. Huge house. You know, I don't know how much money he's got, but I know he's not hurting for anything. Okay? Kids are in, in, in Ivy League schools, you know, two doctors. There's a finance guy now and another, I don't even know. Uh, they all do math, so I, I stay out of it. Uh, yeah, they, I, 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 I just go deaf as soon as anybody mentions numbers. I just, whatever. But um, that was what impacted me. That was what impacted me. Those two verses and the character of a Muslim. Because it went against everything I had thought I knew about Islam. Hope that answers your question. Anybody else? Uh, my question, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but when you finally made the choice to convert, was there a lot of pressure when you worried about how the people had your other friends were going to be? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mashallah, thank you, thank you. Uh, who here, is, is there any recent converts, reverts, 
to Islam? Anybody? Anybody? I always look over to the sisters because usually they're the ones doing the, you know, they change a lot more than the Americans do or the men. But no? Okay. You a recent convert? No, sir. Oh. Well, it's a salam. I just had an interesting conversation with Brother Dennis here, and I put him on front street, but we were just having this conversation about hate, and he was saying that I, I work mental health. You know, I'm an unemployed PhD student, and I'm going to put that out there, but he was saying that uh, we were having this conversation about hate, and he was saying that people that hate Muslims are insane or crazy. And I, and I said, it's not necessary. And I said, just because you hate, somebody you hate the Islamic community, or you hate the Jewish community, so it doesn't mean that these people are insane. You know, these people might need help. And I, and I made mention of you. And I said, because of this movement today, I said, he's not insane. And I said, all these people are thinking he's crazy. You know, and he just too accepted his love. I, I, I said that a lot of times people don't want to see treatment. They don't know how to. Uh, talk about this issue, about the, like you said, our differences. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to talk about the differences. Uh, but, you know, my explanation, not everybody that hates is insane. No, no, no. And I and that's a good point, brother. I, I I'll I'll come back to that. But when you were talking about about how how the rest of I guess my people looked at me, <laughs> well, I was actually still in the military. I uh, was awaiting my retirement because it took so long. It, I I waited for five years on my retirement. I, they just had me. Uh, that, that's a whole other story. I won't get into that, but it was just I was just waiting around, still getting paid, and just waiting to be retired. Um, and so I was still in the military. I went in to uh, get some dog tags, my dog tags printed, okay, and your religion goes on there. So I I I told them I, they said, do do you, are are you no preference or do you have a religion? And uh, I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Muslim. And they're like, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm a Muslim now. I've been a Muslim now for a couple weeks, man. They said, what is wrong with you, man? They, you know, I mean, that, that, that's what he said. What is wrong with you? Sarge, you done lost your mind, man. He said, he, he, you know, he said, he said, that TBI stuff's real, isn't it? I said, no, oh, man, I became a Muslim. Well, it was about a week later, I lost my security clearance. It was not a big deal, really, because I was on my way out anyway. I didn't need it, and I really did not want to know anything else that was going on anyway. I didn't care. My friends, uh, the people who I really consider my friends, uh, were, they were in the military. Um, there was a group of us. Uh, they called us. Uh, they actually called it. It was a. There was a movie that came out in the '80s called Band of the Hand or something like that. And that's what they actually called us, Band of the Hand, because we all had tattoos on our hands. Uh, I'm the only one left. Everybody else is gone. Uh, so, but the people I hung out with, uh, they, we don't talk. Uh, and that and that's mutual because uh, you know they they still have the lifestyle that that I had and you know of course I, I don't live like that I, I I don't drink I don't womanize you know that was pretty much our existence well you know so we have nothing to do now we, there's nothing we can do so you know we just don't talk I mean it's not, it, there's nothing really there of course they they don't understand what I was thinking when I became a Muslim, they, they, don't, they don't get that. And that's okay. My family, this is actually a very good story, and this is, this is something I, uh, that I was hoping that there might have been a recent, recent revert here tonight because uh, my family pretty much disowned me. Uh, never had a real good relationship with them, so I really didn't cry about it. Uh, like I said, I was a teenage runaway, um, but I was told, 
I was told that that you're you're welcome to come visit, but you need to leave that Islam stuff at home. I don't even really know what that means, but I took it as you're really not welcome here because if they're not letting me be who I am, then they don't really want to see me. Again, that's okay. My weekends are free. <laughs> it's the way I looked at it. Always a silver lining somewhere. You just got to look at it differently, you know? And um, so when the video, when I was told by the people in New York, he called me up and he says, hey, man, got some good news. And I knew the video was supposed to come out on Facebook like the next week, like Wednesday or something. And he said, hey, your video is going to be on TV this Sunday. And I was like, what? It wasn't supposed to be on TV. It was an internet thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, it's going to be on CBS Sunday morning. I was like, what? He said, yeah, hopefully. Because <laughs> then, then he says, hopefully, because the Mueller report just came out and you might get bumped. Because when it comes to trash and human interest, the trash always wins, never fails. You know? Media's got bills to pay. Hey, I, I, I understand. I understand. But so, you know, but it did, it aired, both of them aired, so you got to hear both of them. But um, I called my parents and said, hey, just want to give you a heads up. Here's what's going to happen on Sunday. I didn't want, just out of respect, I didn't want them to be blindsided. Somebody else see him and say, hey, I saw your son on TV. What's his problem? <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to give him a heads up. And, uh, after it aired, of course, email and everything started blowing up, and I was reading through comments, which I probably shouldn't have done. There's people out there that aren't very nice. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but um, my stepmom calls me, and she was crying. I said, "What's going on?" You know. They, you know, I'm thinking, oh man, dad, dad saw that thing on TV and he had a heart attack. So, you know, great. Um, she apologized. They both apologized and says, we are so sorry. We had no idea what you were going through. Now, for those of you who didn't see the video, I, I guess you'd have to watch it to maybe understand that a little bit better. But, but that's what they said. And they says, for from now on, we want you to know that you're welcome here just as you are. Wow. I changed the world. So, that was how my family reacted at first. And there's still elements, you know. I actually went back last week and uh, my cousin, who, who's always had a problem, you know, well, he has, I, it's not a problem. We. We act more like brothers towards each other. We're always saying something, you know, teaseful, you know, teasing each other about something or saying something sarcastic to one another. Like I have, he, he's got a big truck. He's one of those guys. Got a big truck, right? I got a little car. <laughs> well, I, actually, it's a, it's a Chevy Spark, which is a, a gas-only powered Prius. That's what it is. Uh, it, it actually gets the same amount of gas mileage. And that's why I got the car, 38 miles a gallon, <laughs> whatever. You know, I got nothing to prove. I don't need to look cool. <laughs> so, so it, I I had a car. I, I parked my car next to my cousin, and and I said, "Hey, man, I don't want. I, I want you to know my car is there, dude. I don't want you running over my car." He said, "That's a car." He said, "I thought that was a booger." <laughs> I was like, "Oh man." But, but, you know, and I, I showed up this last week because we had another funeral. And uh, he, he, uh, he come up to me, give me a big hug, and he says, where's your sheet? <laughs> I, said, I said, brother, I only wear it out when I, when, when I give sermons on Friday, man. I usually don't wear it out from day to day, man. He's like, oh, I'm just messing with you anyway. Man. I, I said, oh, no, it's okay, man. It's okay. Hey, if, you can't, if you can't laugh about it, you know. Okay. And... That's the other thing I see too. A lot of times, it's, and it's it's mostly it's mostly a lot of the older Muslims. 
Laugh at yourselves. Really. Because we're funny. I'm not going to lie. We are funny people. You know, we look funny. We do funny things. You know, especially to men. You know, it, just ask your wives. We are funny. It's not always in a good way, but we're funny. And, and, and w the enjoyment. There's a lot of enjoyment I see, especially out of the older Muslims. And I, and I, I, I don't understand. It, it actually kind of concerns me. It kind of concerns me because I, I don't know if they're just like taking everything too serious. You know, I mean, it is serious. I, you know, I'm older now, so I got to think about that. You know, it's like, hey, you know, I'm not that young guy anymore. I'm not, I'm not the guy who, who used to jump over walls and kick in doors. You know, I try to jump over a wall now. I'm liable to break a hip, <laughs> you know. But I'm not going to take things so serious that I don't enjoy my life anymore. Allah made the religion to bring us together and to enjoy our lives here. That's subjective, though, because it's what you make of it. If you take that knowledge, you live the, the uh, Islam, you live the lifestyle, you do what you're supposed to do, you live by the pillars, you will enjoy your life here. I've learned that because I've lived that other life. I've lived the partying. I did all that. Did all that. Don't need it. Found out that I actually have as much fun now as I ever had. And I don't have to worry about feeling sick in the morning. <laughs> I'm good. You know? So anyway, I probably need to start wrapping this up. Because I think we need to pray again. Yeah? Yes. Oh, New Zealand. Okay. No, that that's a very good question. Uh, the brother was asking, with my knowledge of of where I was, where I am, what I went through, especially talking about the teardrops. Um, what would I do to change the guy who went into the mosque in New Zealand, right? Okay. Um, that is an easy and a hard question to answer. It's a very good question. But it relies on that other person. Because you can always say what you're going to do. You can always say what you, what you would want to do. The brother who met him at the door and said, Salam alaikum, welcome, brother. That's at that point, without knowing anything else, is the best that you could do. Now, me and and this is still something I go through myself. You know, I'm not that bad guy on that you see on, on my paper anymore you know, physically, but I would act a whole lot different if I saw anybody walking towards me with a rifle. Um, but once I, if I was able to contain that situation, I would take that individual and I would sit down with him because that's who I am now. That's what Allah has decreed for me to do, not to hurt that individual even though the malice he had in his own heart because I was that person different method but I was that person but when I was greeted at the door I took a minute I opened my mind shut my mouth and turned my TV off for eight weeks I was that person I don't like guns that's the bomb was better but 
That's a case by case. There, there, there is no blanket answer for something like that. That would have to be a case by case. But what I'm doing now, and by hopefully motivating some of you to get out there and start to make those changes, make yourself known, and show people the true side of Islam, not the Fox News side of Islam, the true side. Show them that character. Show them that, hey, we're, we're a brotherhood, all of us. We're a sisterhood, all of us. We have this. And this is why. And this is how it's done. I don't know what's wrong with those people. I can't say they're not Muslim. And sometimes that really irritates me that I can't say that. But I can say they're not acting Islamically. I can say that. But uh, to answer that question would be very hard uh, to actually give it an answer because it would be case by case. Uh, what I know now, I, I, I think I would be better suited to, to, to handle that situation because I was that person. So I understand, I can empathize with that person, uh, how they feel and the hatred that they feel. So, sorry. So, uh, so we have five minutes. So, okay. I want to ask the, the sisters, because none of the sisters have asked any questions, and I know y'all are shy and this, that, and the other until you get home, because I, I could probably just ask the husbands over here. But anyway, okay, I got one right there. Have a water bottle, I'm sorry. Okay. Not till afterwards, not while I was studying, because the the, the uh, where I come from as far as like being in the military and stuff like that you know it, it's more of a, a, a machismo kind of setting and stuff so the fear really isn't a factor it's like you know get over it kind of thing right that's where I came from but it's not that easy you can't just get over it. you know when you when you go outside the store and you worry if somebody's gonna run over you with their car you know uh, you can't just get over it. But you got to have confidence in Allah that He's going to protect you. But He doesn't want you to hide. Doesn't want you to hide. And I think that's the biggest thing to remember, sister. Not to hide. Okay? That's what they want. It's not what Allah wants. Hopefully that answered your question. Okay, I think we probably ought to give it up. Thank you. I appreciate everybody coming tonight. I appreciate you asking me to come. Uh, I just found out the other day that they said, because uh, I was already going to the, the other masjid, and they said, hey, uh, when you're done there, you want to go down to uh, Stockton? And I was like, all right. <laughs> sure. I'm already there. So, But I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I came. Great, great crowd. I, I, I love your masjid. This is one of four masjids I've been in since I've been a Muslim. I think it's four. 